What's up, Night Owl? Still here back with another Candle Keep video, and today we're going to be looking at Chapter 2, Mass Frost Mighty Digressions. And just like before, I will be providing a map for this chapter, which will be available in the Discord. Link is in the description. Join the Discord, set your role to Dungeon Master, and you'll have access to the Dungeon Master's text channel. And from there, I'll be providing the Candle Keep maps that, I, that, I'm read, that I'm having redone. Now, the map that I'm putting in the Discord is for the Amber Dune hideout map, but you may also want a random encounter map. Now, I don't have one of those on hand. I just pulled one from r slash battle maps. There's tons of resources online. Just grab a simple dirt road battle map for a random encounter. You're going to need this for the first encounter with the Were Rat, which I'll cover more of that later in the video, but the party will be ambushed on their way to Baldur's Gate and having a good map for that, just a random encounter map. They're all over the place. Grab one of those for that particular encounter, and you'll be good to go. Just those two maps should be fine. And by the way, I do live stream these games on Twitch. Link is down there in the description. You can come and see exactly how I run each of these chapters, any corrections that I make in real time, or just ask questions to me directly. You can do that right there in the live stream. Let's get to the video. So the premise of this chapter is that a group of jackal wares have lost their leader, a Lamia named Nadalia. The twist here is that Nadalia is actually peaceful and compassionate, unlike a normal Lamia who is chaotic evil and slavers and they have their jackal wares kidnapping people. This isn't the way for uh, Nadalia and her pack. She's actually nice to them. Now, the book says that she's not altruistic and she does care about her own ends and her own pack, but she is not inherent. She's not evil. Uh, she's more neutral. Unfortunately, a group of adventurers killed their leader, Nadalia, anyway, so the Jackal Wares are out to try to resurrect her. In order to resurrect her, the Jackal Wares need to scrounge up a thousand gold pieces for a resurrection. In order to raise money, the pack has decided to sell books and scrolls out of Baldur's Gate. Unfortunately, because Baldur's Gate is so corrupt, most of their profits are going into bribery and just overall trying to stay alive in the city. The Jackal Wares have resorted to scamming people by selling them creatures disguised as exotic and valuable books in their collection. Three of these exotic books have made their way to Candlekeep, and one of them has fallen into the hands of the party. And that's where we start this chapter with the party being attacked by the creature disguised as a book. The way that I started this chapter off was I had the entire party inside of their extra-dimensional mansion, which they got from chapter one, and they're all sitting around the dinner table waiting on the homunculi to finish cooking them dinner. While they wait, they're all just sort of doing their research, their Candlekeep thing, reading books that they pulled from Candlekeep or maybe from Fastandia's library. And then one of the books animates and attacks. The creature is known as a Gingwatsim or Gingwatsim. I've heard him pronounced both ways. I couldn't find the official pronunciation on the internet. Either way, this creature's name is a mouthful. And I actually had one of my players call it a Gingwatsit, which kind of stuck. So that's what I'm going to be calling it. Now you have an opportunity here while the party is reading this book to give them some information that they can use in the future. The book Maz Froth's Mighty Digressions actually covers some information on lycanthropes as well as demon lords, both of which can be used in the future of this particular session. The party will encounter a were rat on their way to Baldur's Gate and maybe again later on, and they'll also encounter jackal wares, obviously. So, and jackal wares aren't officially lycanthropes, but they're often mistaken for one. So you can just kind of put that information in the lycanthropy se section of the book that the party's reading. Also, Lamia are created by the demon lord Grotz, so you could also put that information in there. Grotz created Lamia, Lamia used jackal wares, Grotz created jackal wares. You can put all the things, not necessarily info dump, but you can kind of hint at some of these things and maybe give them advantage on their information role later on. Once the party has dealt with the gang, what's it? They're going to want to know what's going on. And the most logical course of action from there would probably be to ask the avowed adjutant that was assigned to them as their sort of escort around Candlekeep. The adjutant will tell the party that this is the third book to transform and attack somebody in the last two months. The adjutant will also provide the records of who gifted these books to Candlekeep and where they are. Two of those NPCs are still here in Candlekeep for the party to question. The third one is left kind of ambiguous. They don't even give a name. Uh, if the party asks, you can make up a name and just say they're not here anymore. Keep in mind that the more mysterious you are with this third NPC, the more likely it is that the party's going to want to latch on to it. So be prepared for that. One option could be that that third NPC lives in Baldur's Gate, and that gives the party another reason to go there. And another option could be to have the NPC be credible, and the, the avowed will actually vouch for them, just in case the party starts getting suspicious about this NPC. The avowed will actually offer the party a reward for finding out who's behind this deception a helm of comprehend languages. I changed this magic item to be more tailored to the party. Like if I have a spellcaster in the party, I make this a wand of whatever their favorite damaging first level spell is. 
Like, for example, if you have an evoker, it could be a wand of burning hands or frost knife. If you have a necromancer, ray of sickness. I get a lot of questions about how I do loot, and I think a wand is a solid option. If you have a spellcaster, that'll free up some of their slots. If you give them their their favored damaging spell as a wand, that'll let them spend their slots on other stuff. But moving on. One more thing that I would add to the information being provided by the adjutant is information about the Ging What's It and how they're created. This will give the party a baseline for a plot point that comes up later in the chapter. Corvala, the new leader of the Jackal Wares, was taught the ritual to create the Ging What's-Its by Nadalia. Once the party has all of this information, they may want to question the two NPCs that are still here in Candlekeep that gifted the books that resulted in an attack. Galarian High Scroll will tell the party that they bought Mass Frost Mighty Digressions 10 days ago from a marketplace in the upper city of Baldur's Gate. They will also tell the party that they don't remember the name of the stall, but it had the word Dune in it, and they arrived at Candlekeep five days ago. Valor is a retired purple dragon knight turned bounty hunter, and she's here in Candlekeep researching one of her targets. In case it comes up, I made the target a doppelganger, and if the party approaches her while she's researching or while she's doing any reading, they will see books on shape changers and identifying doppelgangers and things like that. Valor will tell the party that she arrived at Candlekeep 13 days ago, and she'll echo what Eulerian said that she bought the book at a market stall in the upper city of Baldur's Gate. This should be enough to get your party to travel to Baldur's Gate, which is five days away. And just to alleviate any concerns, you could also have the avowed tell the party that because they're they're investigating this for Candlekeep, the avowed will allow them to re-enter without donating another book. On their way to Baldur's Gate, the party's going to be ambushed by a were-rat named Mushika and a couple of giant rats. If you have a party member with Baldur's Gate in their backstory, you could say that they've heard of Mushika and how they were a member of the Thieves Guild, but they suddenly disappeared, and now here they are. Now, as far as loot goes for Mushika, the book doesn't have any, so I added two potions of healing and a potion of Zephyr Strike. This seems to fit the, the Mushika's whole rogue, roguish Thieves Guild theme. I gave them a piece of jewelry worth 250 gold pieces. That way the party had some gold to spend while they're in Baldur's Gate. And I also gave him a plus one magic weapon that a party member could use. This will come in handy later on when the party fights the Jackal Wares. Somebody will be able to bypass their resistance. And of course, Mushika will use this weapon against the party. So it was fun to kind of allude to what their treasure was going to be if they defeated this were rat. In one game, I had a rogue that liked to use daggers. So I gave Mushika a dagger of venom. And in another game, I had a ranger that liked to use a longbow, so I gave Mushika a plus one longbow that generates its own arrows. A magical bow that generates its own arrows is one of my favorite things to give a low-level bow user because it eliminates the need to keep track of ammunition. Once the party arrives at Baldur's Gate and reaches the marketplace, there's going to be a number of stalls for them to shop at, two of which I want to bring attention to. The Wizards of the Wide, which sells spell scrolls, and I also had them selling spell components. That way, if you have somebody chromatic or find familiar, identify, things like that, they can find their components here. The other is Coppers to Crowns, which is an antique shop, and I added a clockwork amulet for sale here for 100 gold pieces. Now, this part is very important for you DMs to pay attention to. How you present the information in this part of the adventure is going to dictate so much about the outcome. You are going to be in control of this situation more than you probably would like. There is just a lot of information going on behind the scenes with these jack wares that the party is just unaware of and they can't make an informed decision. The party is already approaching this situation suspicious and if they pass the knowledge check to know what a jack aware is and how evil they are and how they kidnap people and bring them to their Lamia chaotic evil demon worshipping masters in order to be slaves that it's not going to work out for the jack aware especially since they're natural liars they're not going to believe a word and they may just start swinging right away. On the flip side of that if you're really on the nose about how these jack awares are different and how they're they're nice and they're not like the other ones and their leader is a Lamia, but is also nice. You may be, you may be too obvious and you may push them too far in the other way and they won't attack. In my opinion, this story is very well written. The party is totally justified to execute every one of these jack -awares. They're selling these hostile creatures to people that could result in them dying. But at the same time, these are somewhat good guys just trying to get by and the party may sympathize with them. Well, maybe not good, but neutral. And the important thing is that they're a symbol that not all jack aware and Lamia are inherently evil and that there is some sort of redemption. Even though they are selling these creatures that attack people, they're not immediately hostile to the party and they are willing to negotiate with them. And their leader, Corvala, will even provide the party the books as recompense for, for insulting Candlekeep. So yeah, that was just a little side note that I felt needed to be said to you DMs out there. 
how you present the information here is going to heavily impact the outcome of this chapter and the line going one way or another is paper thin. With all that out of the way, your party approaches Amber Dune Books and immediately the Jackalware at the counter tries to sell them a book. Now I had two Jackalware here and Corvala just to make things easier because if your party starts immediately asking questions about the gang what's it's and candle keep and all that, the Jackalware are gonna panic and they're gonna wanna send the party to Corvala anyway. So I went ahead and just had her here, that way she could take care of it once the party starts asking those serious questions. Also something to note, the image of the guy trying to sell the book has a ton of little jackal statues all over the book stand. I thought that was really cool. And in Roll20, this is actually a handout. I give that handout to the party like, here's the stall and you notice these jackals. And if the party asked that, you know, jackals obviously, or jackal wares are obviously going to lie every chance they get. So I had it, I had them just tell them like, oh, that's our house sigil but it still sort of hints at the fact that they're jackal wares. And, and I really like that. So that's just something to keep in mind. That particular image, if you give them the handout and you show them this image, you could point out that there are jackals there and maybe they'll roll an insight to see if they're lying about the whole, that's our house sigil thing. So from here, your party is going to start asking these jackal wares questions. And a good rule to follow here for this line of questioning is that the jackal wares are going to lie. Always. They're jackal wares. There's even this myth that jackal wares feel physical pain when they tell the truth. So they're going to just start lying and any insight role is going to result in a, they're lying about all of it. Uh, yeah, I'm looking for a book called Mass Frost Mighty Digressions. Nope, don't got it. Never heard of it. Are you by chance a jackal wear who is selling creatures disguised as books? Nah. If the party starts asking questions with that level of subtlety, then Corvala will step in and ask that they not make a scene and then invite them back to the hideout where they can talk in private. If the party instead decides to stake the place out and wait for them to close, the jackal wares will close the place up, pack up the books, and then head back to the hideout. Either way, the party will reach the hideout. The only variable is whether or not Corvala is escorting them. If the party is not being escorted by Corvala and the party did not kill Mushika during the ambush on the way to Baldur's Gate, then Mushika will have hired a few guards and a swarm of rats in order to exact vengeance on the party when they reach the lower or the, the black gate. Whereas the upper city is more of the noble district, the outer city is more of the slums. And this is where Amber Dune hideout is. Let's have a look at that map. Area one is the common room. Here is where the jackal wares like to relax and chat with each other. And there's also a rug of smothering here that is friendly to the jackal wares and will defend them if combat breaks out. The rug will also attack intruders if there's no jackal wares in the area. Combat in this room will alert the jackal wares in area two, but not in area three. Area two is the kitchen, and there are two jackal wares here in this room. One is chopping vegetables for a soup, and the other is leaned against the wall talking to them. Combat in area one will cause this jackal ware to go investigate while the other continues to cook. Area three is the corridor dormitory. There is a sleeping jackal ware here that will wake up if the party moves through this room unless they succeed on a DC 10 stealth check. This check is made with disadvantage if combat broke out in the previous areas. If combat breaks out in this room, it will alert the jackal ware in area five, who will charge in scimitar drawn and attack. If Corvala is in area four, she may also investigate any noise made in this room. Area four is Corvala's office. There are two decorative swords on the wall that are actually ging what's that will attack any intruders unless Corvala is present. The journal on Corvala's desk is a ledger documenting all of Amber Dune's book sales. And you can also hint at the Jackal Ware's financial troubles by having notes in here about paying off bribes and dealing with local gangs shake local gang shakedowns there's also a trap door in this room that leads to the hidden vault area six area five is the storage room and in here there is a jack aware who is looking through the bookshelves to decide which books should be sold at the market the following day one of the trunks in this room is actually a mimic that is friendly to the amber dune pack the trunk beneath the mimic is a real trunk and it has about 50 gold pieces worth of coin this trunk is also an opportunity to spice up the loot a little bit I added a periapt of wound closure to this trunk. Area six is the hidden vault. Down here, there are two trunks. One of them has Nadalia's heart in it, as well as 450 gold pieces, the gold that the Jackal Ware have been saving up for her resurrection. And the other trunk has six books, three of which are the authentic copies, a book on Ging Watsits, a book on the Outer Plains, and a book on Lamias. If the party was brought to the hideout by Corvala, then Corvala will open up to the party about their plan and what happened with Nadalia and all of these things. She will even tell the party that she was taught the ritual to create the Gingwatsits by Nadalia herself, 
but she's under the effects of a geese quest and cannot share the information on how to create them or the details of the ritual. Corvalla will also tell the party that she never intended for any of these books to end up in Candlekeep. She probably knew that they would send adventurers after them. Go figure. As reparations, she will give the party the three original copies of the books that turned and attacked at Candlekeep. Mass Frost, Mighty Digressions, The Dark Hunger, and The Fallen Tethumar. If the party brings those three books back to Candlekeep, that's quest complete. The party also has the option to help these jackal wares, and that will make them a very powerful ally if they, for example, provide the gold needed to resurrect Nadalia, or help them come up with a better plan to make the money than scamming people. These are, there's several different ways that they go about, go about it other than the combat. There's also the combat option where they clear the place out, take the gold and loot and run. But if they do the the negotiations and they actually like talk to the jackal wares and tell them that this idea is stupid, here's a better way to do it, they will listen and they could become allies and who knows where it could go from there. But this is, of course, for an extended campaign, not a one shot. And that's it for Mass Frost Mighty Digressions. I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you did, you know how YouTube works. Hit those buttons, leave a comment down below. Let me know what you think of Chapter 2 of Candlekeep. And if you want to see these games take place live, I do stream them on Twitch. Monday through Friday, 7 to 10 p.m. Central Time. The link is in the description. Come by, ask questions, let me know what you think. And as always, I'll see you at sundown.